This video is published under the Creative Commons license BYNCSA, which means attribution, non-commercial and share-alike. Third-party material has been used for which the permission is specified explicitly for every diagram, photograph or whatever has been used. Please mention the author as Andreas Pfennig, Products, Environment and Processes, Department of Chemical Engineering, Université de Liège, Belgium. A disclaimer applies. Welcome back to this video series on thermal unit operations and with this video I would like to start a small sequence of videos on general considerations about separation processes, especially in this series on step constructions. I would like to start that with some preliminary remarks as an introduction. If we look at several separation processes we realize that we can apply step constructions to design that equipment. We have realized such a step construction as a McCaptile diagram for rectification, but you can also apply that for solvent extraction, absorption and so on. So it makes sense to step back a little bit and try to derive this method, the step construction method, independent of the specific separation process and see where it gets us. Before we can apply it, we first need to derive or have a look at certain assumptions and then later on we will apply to a very different individual cases, so to speak. So we will derive here in this section, in this series of videos, we will derive very basic considerations uh, that then allow us to apply this meth method to a wide variety of separation processes. As mentioned, we should first have a look at the assumptions. So, let's collect some of the assumptions. Well, if we look at separation processes, we realize that they usually are most efficient if we operate them in a countercurrent mode. And that's actually where the step construction is usually applied to. So we assume that we have a countercurrent process. We also want to assume that we use that in the most efficient way, that is in a continuous operation. So not a batch process, but a continuous process. And as always, well, mostly at least in this introductory lecture, we will deal with a continuous process in steady state conditions. So we have a continuous process. And that is in steady state. We apparently need that steady state assumption for applying the appropriate balances later on. Then we want to assume as we have done also in deriving the McCaptile diagram, that the equipment, the separation process, can be separated into a sequence of theoretical stages. So we have a sequence of theoretical stages. Okay. So that are some of the boundary conditions. This is in principle sufficient to derive the step construction process. But usually we want to get some one step further. We would like to have the operating lines as straight lines as we have seen it actually in the McCaptile diagram. So we actually would like to have these operating lines as straight lines. For that we need to make further assumptions. Well, of course, there are some general conditions we have to meet for setting up the balances. We want to assume that we have two flow rates in a countercurrent fashion. We said that already, but we want to name them L dot and G dot. And as we have argued in distillation, we want them to be constant. And of course, they are not constant over the entire process, but just in a certain section of the equipment. And of course it is then this section that we regard as a first step and then we look how we can combine these different sections by different intermediate things, by feed, by a, a product removal or whatever. 
that is then, so to speak, the linking element between two of such sections. So let's first have a look at the sections in the following and then we will, uh, following videos, and then we will apply that in combination with various elements that can link different sections. So we assume that they are constant and at the same time we want to have a single variable that describes the composition. So a one-dimensional concentration measure. To express it very generally. Well, for distillation we have shown how it works. We uh, had, uh, we took into account that we have equimolar uh, condensation and evaporation to ensure that in each column section we have constant L dot and G dot flow rates. And we had also a one-dimensional concentration measure, which was for a binary system, the component mole fraction, where the component was, or for one component, which was in that case the light body component by convention. So we had just one concentration, one mole fraction. Of course, the mole fraction of the other component is defined by that because of the summation condition, x1 plus x2 always has to add up to unity. And because of that, we have actually only one degree of freedom with respect to composition. So we have that case that I have just described. We can have L dot and G dot being overall constant flow rates. And in this relation that are indeed the overall flow rates, so all components combined. And the one-dimensional concentration measure is the mole fraction in a binary system. One should also say that in principle, all this can also be described, of course, on a mass basis. So we also have the option to use mass flow rates and mass fractions. Of course, here the summation condition holds as well. And if we can assure, ensure that the flow rates L dot and G dot, that they are constant on a mass basis, then we can apply the same thing on a mass basis. I mentioned that in the very beginning of, of this lecture, you, are always, you always have these two options, molar-based or mass-based. You only have to do it consistently. If I say consistently, it means that you really have to regard everything in the appropriate um, space, so to speak, on the, on the corresponding variable. So if you are on a molar basis, you have to describe the equilibrium in, for the equilibrium stages on a molar basis, the flow rates are on a molar basis, also the assumptions need to lead to a constant flow rates on a molar basis and you have to use the concentration measures as being on a molar basis as well. You can do the same on a mass basis of course, then the equilibrium information has to be on a mass basis, the assumptions has, have to hold on a mass basis, so you have really have to look what are your systems looking like, what are the conditions there, how does the density change, for example, if the composition changes, that leads to possibly statements about uh, if the L dot and G dot are constant under which boundary conditions, and the concentration measure has to be chosen consistently. But there exists a completely different way to achieve the same results, the same requirements that L dot and G dot are constant and that we have a one-dimensional concentration measure that fully describes the, allows to describe the balances as well as the equilibrium. And that is, for example, relevant if we are in extraction or, or absorption. For example, let's regard solvent extraction. We have a fermentation broth where we have a product in that fermentation broth that we want to extract with a solvent. So we add an organic phase, an organic solvent, and then the transfer component, our product component, is transferred into uh, our extractant phase. Now, we of course choose the extractant such that it does not dissolve in the fermentation broth, not significantly, and also we want, don't want to have that the fermentation broth dissolves in the extractant. Which means if we regard the flow rate just of the extractant without regarding the product, that flow rate will be constant. Also, since the fermentation brought the carrier component, so to speak, so the water with the microbes and the nutrients or whatever, that will not dissolve in the extract, and so that will also stay constant from stage to stage. So we don't have to assume equimolar counter uh, transport across the interface as we, as we did for distillation with the equimolar uh, condensation evaporation. We don't have to assume that. But we just have to assume that the two major phases, 
the carrier components of the major phases actually, that they don't dissolve in each other. So no fermentation broth in the um, organic phase, no extractant dissolved in the fermentation broth. So if the L dot and G dot, the major components of they, that, the carrier components are insoluble in each other, then the L dot and G dot are constant in the equipment throughout that section that we are regarding. Then of course we have to use different concentration measures because in the end we still want to have flow rate times that concentration characterizing the mole flow rate, the molar flow rate or mass flow rate of that component we are regarding and of course the component we are regarding in that case is the product. So what we actually have to use is a different concentration measure which has different names. It's called either molar or weight ratio, Bancroft coordinates and I would like to call it for simplicity just as a load. So we have the loads. For, for example for the liquid or for the, actually correctly one should say the L-dot phase, we don't know if it's liquid or gas, it depends, I mean we, are free. we, we didn't say anything about the state of the phase. We want to, I want to write it as a capital X and these uh, capital letters always have this little hook at their top right. So this is a capital X, which is defined now if I write it on a molar basis as the amount of substance in a sample that I'm taking of the transfer component, for example the product of the fermentation broth, divided by the amount of substance of the carrier component of, well in this case, the L-dot phase. So the carrier of the L-dot phase. If we are in solvent extraction from a fermentation broth, the L-dot may be the flow rate of that fermentation broth and then the water plus the nutrients plus the microbes is the amount of substance of that uh, L-dot phase. And then you realize actually that possibly it may be wise to do that on a mass basis, but because who knows the moles of microbes. Yeah? So for technical purposes it's sometimes helpful to use the mass basis instead of the molar basis. Nevertheless, this is defined here on the molar basis. And you, you have the choice uh, for absorption that may be a good idea, for example, to use it on a molar basis as well. For the second phase you have the same, but of course, I just indicated like that, but of course there you have to take in the carrier of the G-dot phase, apparently. So that's correspondingly defined. This again are one-dimensional concentration measures, X and Y, that describe the composition of the transfer component with respect to the corresponding carrier component. It's ensured that in the end multiplying this composition with the flow rate, you wind up with the flow rate of the transfer component. If you multiply this with the flow rate of the carrier component, then you wind up exactly with the flow rate of the transfer component, which is exactly desired for the balances. So that works out quite fine. Of course you have to write or plot the equilibrium con uh, e um, conditions or the equilibrium situation also based on these loads. Then you can come up actually with identical uh, design diagrams in the end. So these are the assumptions that are required in order to be able to set up the balances and solve them for obtaining a stage construction, a step construction in a Y-X diagram, as we will see later, uh, and use that for the design of corresponding equipment. As I said and mentioned several times now, um, we uh, can do all these things on a molar as well on a as on a mass basis. And now let me collect that information on a single slide, and if I do that, we wind up with uh, this uh, diagram, it's so to speak the take-home message of this very first video. We have on the one hand side the mass-based approach or the molar-based approach, they're equivalent, they lead to the same method so to speak. And we have two methods on the one hand side accounting for the total flux, L dot G dot referring to the total flux. We have to have an equi equimolar or an equi equal mass uh, counter transport across the interface so that the flow rates are constant. We can use mole or weight fraction and 
Of course, in the end, we are in a pseudo-binary system. Pseudo means that possibly there are more components present in the system, but we can group them so as if that were just one component and are able to describe the balances as well as the equilibrium just with these two, two balance components. For distillation, this is a little bit tricky, but for example, if there are two components that behave more or less identically and you want to keep them together, you don't need to separate them, but you can regard them as just one pseudo-component, just to give you an example. The other option is that you regard only the carrier flux, that we have one transfer component being transferred from one carrier to the other carrier flow rate. We can describe that on a molar or on a ma as mass loads and of course in that case we have a pseudo ternary system. We have the ca one carrier, we have the second carrier and we have the transfer components. So actually we have a ternary system. And it's still, again, a pseudo-ternary system because, as mentioned before, if you have a fermentation broth, that's a multi-component system, system, even if you regard it as only being one of the phases. So it's a pseudo-ternary system in that case. But of course it can be a, ternary, a real ternary system under certain other conditions, depending on your step, your separation step you're looking at. Possibly you just really have a ternary system, say an aqueous wastewater stream that contains one component that you want to extract, for example, phenol is a typical case that you want to remove by a solvent extraction where you add a pure um, organic phase to remove that. That's one option that you may have in that context. So it can be ternary or pseudo-ternary depending on the separation you are actually regarding in your specific, uh, special case. So we have two ways to look at the overall at the flow rates, total flux or carrier flux everything else being regarded in a consistent way, and we have the option of mass-based and molar-based uh, considerations. Everything, again, has to be consistent throughout applying this method, so from the very start, from the assumptions, so you have to check the assumptions if they hold in your corresponding box, so to speak, if everything fits together, and then you can apply it and will wind up in the end with identical diagrams, identical description. With that, I'm at the end of this first uh, uh, introductory uh, um, section, the preliminaries. With that, I would like to say thank you, and I hope to see you again in the next video.